This is the final Common Ancestry video. The first Common Ancestry video looked at the history of evolutionary thought, and videos 2, 3, 4, 5, and New Kinds took us through the various Common Ancestors, dropping us off at the most recent Common Ancestor of all eukaryotic organisms around 1.5 billion years ago. Today we'll exit the eukaryotes and enter the world of prokaryotes, so let's jump right in. In eukaryotes, many different lineages have become multicellular. Some estimates put the number of independent lineages of multicellular organisms at 25. Experiments with unicellular organisms forming multicellular aggregates have been promising. Chlorella vulgaris is a unicellular green alga that, in a 1998 experiment, was put in an environment with the predatory, flagellated protist Ochromonist valesia. After just a few generations, chlorella in groups of tens to hundreds pervaded the culture. And after 10 to 20 generations, chlorella groups of eight cells, perhaps the best fit, remained indefinitely. That way, the alga was too large to be eaten by the ochromonus, but small enough so that all its members got adequate nutrition. The 2013 paper, Experimental Evolution of an Alternating Uni and Multicellular Life Cycle in Chlamydomonas reinhardti, has this to say, quote, We subject the alga, Chlamydomonas reinhardti, to conditions that favor multicellularity, resulting in the evolution of a multicellular life cycle in which clusters reproduce via motile unicellular propagules. Those are structures that can give rise to new organisms. While a single-cell genetic bottleneck during ontogeny, which is growth and development, is widely regarded as an adaptation to limit among cell conflict, its appearance very early in this transition suggests that it did not evolve for this purpose. Instead, we find that unicellular propagules are adaptive even in the absence of intercellular conflict, maximizing cluster-level fecundity. These results demonstrate that the unicellular bottleneck, a trait essential for evolving multicellular complexity, can arise rapidly via co-option of the ancestral unicellular form." Close quote. Once they had similar genetic material, they could evolve in size and complexity over the billions of years. As it turns out, there is an intermediate between unicellular chlamydomonas and colonial vulvox that can range from 2 to 32 cells called gonium. The 2005 paper, A 12-Step Program for Evolving Multicellularity and a Division of Labor, and the 2016 paper, The Gonium Pectorale Genome Demonstrates Co-Option of Cell Cycle Regulation During the Evolution of Multicellularity, provide yet more clues as to how multicellularity evolved. So, with multicellularity out of the way, what about the origin of eukaryotes? Eukaryotes, remember these are organisms with nuclei in their cells, arose due to an event called endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis occurred when an archaean, which is one of two domains of prokaryotes, incorporated a bacterium, the other domain of prokaryotes, into its cellular morphology. More specifically, the bacterial ancestor of mitochondria was an alpha proteobacteria similar to rickettsia. Biologists know that mitochondria are derived from bacteria due to such facts as the mitochondria having their own genomes and ribosomes. Side note, a later secondary endosymbiotic event resulted in chloroplasts in plants, which are derived from cyanobacteria. Now what about the cell nucleus? Research indicates, such as the 2006 paper, Selective Forces for the Origin of the Eukaryotic Nucleus, that a methanogenic archaean, which is one that produces methane as a metabolic byproduct, entered an endosymbiotic relationship with a myxobacterium which is a type of bacteria that feeds on insoluble organic substances. This relationship produced both the eukaryotic nucleus and endoplasmic reticulum, which explains why the eukaryotic nucleus resembles bacteria more than archaea. This relationship is supported by the compartmentalization abilities of the bacteria, along with their possession of kinases and guanine nucleotide binding proteins, which are similar to those of eukaryotes. Kinases are enzymes that catalyze the movement of phosphate, 
and guanine nucleotide binding proteins act as molecular switches within cells. Thus, we enter the world of prokaryotes. Archaean Loki is a thermophilic archaean whose phylum is the closest relative to eukaryotes, sharing a common ancestor with us that lived about 1.9 billion years ago. Archaeans in this phylum are called Loki archaeota, and they are found between Greenland and Norway in the Arctic Ocean. Specifically, Loki archaeota are located around hydrothermal vents in an area called Loki's Castle after the mythical Norse god. But what makes the Loki archaeota so special are their genes. They have five genes for actin, which are molecules that build the cytoskeleton, genes for ESCRT, which are endosomal sorting complexes required for transport, which allow the membranes to bend and bud away from the cytoplasm, and genes for small GTPases, which are enzymes that hydrolyze or add water to guanine triphosphate, which regulates cell growth, differentiation, cell movement, and lipid vesicle transport. Taking in a bacterium for energy regulation allowed eukaryotes to form and become much more complex and contain much larger genomes than the prokaryotes. More distantly related to us are two clades of Archaeans called Tac and Dpan, with whom we share a common ancestor that lived 1.925 and 2.025 billion years ago, respectively. First, Tac, not to be confused with Tac, which is short for Thermus aquaticus, stands for Thom Archaeota, Ag Archaeota, Kren Archaeota, or Eocytes, and Core Archaeota. Second, DPAN stands for a group of closely related extremophile archaean phyla, such as diaferatrites, parvarchaeota, anigmarchaeota, nanohaloarchaeota, and nanoarchaeota. These two groups are important for how they relate to the eukaryotes. In 1984, James Lake and his colleagues proposed that eukaryotes were more closely related to DPAN and TAC than to archaeans also known as the eocyte hypothesis. The eocyte hypothesis lost support, though, to the three domains, which are bacteria, archaeans, and eukaryotes, view, in which DPAN and TAC are within archaea and not closely related to the eukaryotes. Now, with the sequencing of many archaean genomes, microbiologists have reason to believe the eocyte hypothesis may actually be true. Next, we share a common ancestor with all other Archaeans, collectively called Uri Archaeota, that lived 2.125 billion years ago. And we share a common ancestor with bacteria that lived at least 2.5 billion years ago. So bacteria and archaea are considered to be two separate domains, but why is that? For starters, the two have very different cell wall chemistry i.e. bacteria have peptidoglycan in their cell walls while archaea don't. Peptidoglycan is the chemical that gram stains detect. A thick wall means gram positive, while a thin wall means gram negative. Bacteria comprise the oldest fossils in the record, going back to 3.77 billion years ago. We have all heard of the stromatolites, those macroscopic remains of bacterial colonies from the Precambrian, the earliest of which are 3.7 billion years old. Those 3.77 billion year old fossils are microfossil remains from long gone hydrothermal vents. And remember from Abiogenesis Part 2 that life started out at hydrothermal vents. Cyanobacteria appeared later, producing oxygen as a byproduct and polluting the atmosphere with that toxic dioxide that we now depend upon for life. It caused an event known as the Great Oxygenation Catastrophe and it is known as a catastrophe because it had catastrophic effects on the many obligatorily anaerobic bacteria. Now we come to the last universal common ancestor of all life, also known as Luca. Luca lived between 3.8 and 4 billion years ago and was not the first organism that ever lived. Like the Ermetozoan, much about the physiology of Luca is unknown, but some is known about the organism. For instance, it had RNA, DNA and proteins. It had ribosomes, an acetyl-CoA pathway, ATP synthase, and a sodium proton antiporter at the very least. ATP synthase is an enzyme that catalyzes the production of ATP, which is cellular energy. And the sodium proton antiporter is a protein pump that would have helped LUCA survive on smaller hydrogen or proton gradients. 
Luca likely lived near hydrothermal vents, which is where we see the earliest fossils and the origin of life. Thus, on that note, we have reached the base of the Tree of Life, which looks more like a bush at this point. So look where we are now. We've traveled backwards through time, four billion years to the last universal common ancestor of all life. Remember, when we started this reverse pilgrimage of life, we had gone just 100,000 years backwards to the plains of Africa. And now we're on the ocean floor at a hydrothermal vent, watching the deepest evolutionary split history has to offer. At last, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.